And thank you all for your patience. I'm very sorry that I was running so late. There is much traffic out there. So what I'm going to be talking about today is primarily about data portraits and the representation of individuals. So it won't be all the networking things, all those, the things that Deepar mentioned, most of those, while I talk about them in my book, are not what I'll be talking about tonight. But I do want to say that if you have questions or comments while I'm speaking, just raise your hand and we can have it be part lecture, part discussion. What I'm interested in here is um, the one thing that does carry over a lot into this talk from what Dietmar was saying is it's the, the most humanist sort of discussion I have. It's very much about looking at the representation of individuals through their data, but from a very humanist perspective in particular. What I want to do here is put the notion of how do we represent people through data in the context of the entire history of portraiture. And, um, so we'll start in the Renaissance with this painting by Hans Holbein called Anne of Cleves. And the reason I bring it up is that this, has, this painting has a very interesting story with it. Um, it was painted for Henry VIII. So most of you are similar familiar with Henry VIII. He was a king of England who had, went through six wives, many of whom came to a fairly bad end when they displeased him. And Anne, I believe, was number three or four. But the importance of the portrait was, while Henry was out looking for his <coughs> wife, travel was difficult at that time, and he sent his court painter, Hans Holbein, to paint this princess who had been represented, told to him, was very beautiful and make a great wife. Her father was encouraging this. So Hans Holbein spent several months in her father's castle painting her, and he brought the painting back to Henry VIII, who looked at it, and he thought it was so beautiful, and so demure, and so serene, that he married her on the basis of this portrait. Uh, soon after that, uh, soon after he actually got to know her, because he'd really only known the portrait, he decided he could not stand her. And he was very unhappy with her. The whole line was banished for a while. He eventually came back. But um, the reason I bring this up is, is twofold. One is one of the themes we're going to be talking about tonight is this tension between the wishes of the subject, the wishes of the artist, and the audience. What is the person who's viewing it? What do they want to get out of it? What do they want to know about the subject? What, how does the subject want to be represented? How do they want to be seen? And what's the role of the artist? What are they trying to, to say or show about themselves? In this case, it was an artist who was in a very awkward position between, he, because he was installed in Anne of Cleves' father's castle, he couldn't paint a realistic picture of her because her father would have had him off. But then when he brought this flattering picture back to the king, he got into even worse trouble because the king found it eventually not to be a true one. So with that in mind, but there's also the notion of the portrait as a proxy, where instead of the actual person being there, the portrait takes on the role of the proxy. Also in the Renaissance, I think until the 18th century, when, they, when a criminal couldn't be found, at times his portrait was symbolically executed. Um, today, we are back in the situation of using portraits as proxies to a large extent when we think about how we relate to other people online. We're not really seeing the actual physical person there, but some representation of them. Right now, these representations tend to be you know, self-made, they're very, they're not usually formed as portraits, but we do use some kind of proxy representation to get to know people. So thinking of the portrait as proxy is a very important piece. One place where you see this in a very visceral way online is in the world of games, where the avatars in the game world are both something that the person chooses on their own, but there's all kinds of data you know, if you look at, at the person's page you know, from, in different games, there's all kinds of relevant data about who they are, what their role in their game is, what their history has been, what their reputation has been. And within those universes, people use that to, to make sense of that person. To some extent, and I will be showing you later, there are social environments that have started to use this. This is probably not exactly how we want to be thinking about other people, but it's a, a, a thing to keep in mind. What are the pieces of information that give in a particular community, what are the things we would want to know about other people to make sense of them? 
Now, another reason we might want to think about why we want to have portraits online is the notion of, of pseudonymity and names. Online today, we're living in an era where there's an increasing um, emphasis on using real names. But in, in the face-to-face -face world, one of the things to keep in mind is that you're able to maintain a lot of privacy simply by going from situation to situation. You can talk to your friends, but then you can be very different with your professor. You can be different with, you, you can have a conversation with your doctor that's separate than the conversation you have with your children or your parents. Online, once things are done under the same name, search tends to unite everything into one giant blob of information about you. And so and there's a lot of sense that, oh, the only people who would want to use pseudonyms are people who have something nefarious that they're doing. If you're not doing anything underhanded, why would you want to use a pseudonym? So why, so why use the example here of, um, this is drugstore.com. It's a very useful site. You know, this is just the first person I saw when I looked in there one day to grab a screenshot. It's someone named Celeste. You know, but these are her comments on a skin lightening system. Um, that it was, you know, it, you know, her husband would not come within a mile of me due to the way I smelled when I wore that. Okay, that's useful information, um, but is there a reason that you wouldn't necessarily want that to be information that is tied to you under your real name? That, you know, this product made me smell bad. My foot odor didn't really go away when I used this. There are a lot of spaces where you want to maintain some level of privacy and dignity. So I think it's important to remember that the use of pseudonyms online is something where, that we want to support because it gives people not an extra special kind of privacy, but it lets us have the kind of privacy we're used to in everyday life. But to have pseudonyms that make sense, that work, you need to have some kind of information over time about a person. So thinking about how you can accumulate reputation information and history information without relying on a name is another important piece. So the first question we'll get at is how does a portrait re resemble its subject? Now before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about why I'm using the word portrait to begin with, is that when we're dealing in the world of visualization, we often think that our role is to represent the data as exactly as possible. So we want to say, here's the data, I can put it in, out comes a chart, but I can take that chart and move it back and get the data. Accuracy is usually really key. But with a portrait, a lot of what's important is being evocative, how it represents, how it resembles the person in some way. And so when we think about visualizing people through data, it's not necessarily going to always be about what's the most um, correct representation, but what's the one that in some way evokes that person. And so here I just want to start with some notions of what is evocative over history. In medieval times, which was an era where there was a lot more interest in the spiritual world than in you know, what was physically present going on here. You look at medieval tapestries or anything, they're very symbolic. They're not about representing what do the things look like. They were about representing the meaning behind things. And so a lot of medieval portraiture, when portraits were painted or made in sculpture, weren't necessarily what that person looked like, but they represented, um, for instance, they represent rulers in the guise of a Greek or Roman ruler whose attributes and character they thought matched them. So it was a symbolic representation of character, not necessarily a physical face. When you get to the Renaissance, there became much more interest in representing, and this is the sort of the era that we think of as sort of the canonical portrait era. It's very much about what does a person look like? How can we make something that resembles the person's face? Um, and what they're doing. It's very much about what that surface look is. And it's very, it's very recognizable. So a lot of it is about you know, what, it, what shows of a person's character in their face. Now, for a variety of reasons, as we move through history, we're seeing somewhat the end of this here in the first in the 20, 20th century and in the 21st century now. Um, one reason is the rise of photography, where you don't have to painstakingly get what's, you know, paint somebody's face perfectly, anybody can take a picture and to some extent, by definition, the picture is always accurate. You know, it's easy to do, anyone with a snapshot can do that. There's a great quote by the photographer Irving Penn who said, every photograph is accurate, but none of them are true. 
So they all show exactly what a face looks like from a particular angle, but is that it doesn't necessarily say that that is the true version of the person. For one, it's always a very subjective view. It's from a single standpoint. Um, is it necessarily the case? Um, this is a bigger question, and if it's one that interests you, it's one that I talk about at length in the book. But also, to what extent does the face represent a person? One of the big promises of the online world is that we can go beyond the face. Because one of the things, faces are very recognizable. They're very expressive. They're very wonderful. On the other hand, they're also very revealing. And they shape a lot about our society. When you go by somebody's, when you see someone's face, the first things you will learn about them are their race, their age, their gender, you know, a whole, a whole series of things like that, which are, we've partly, it's hard to know what's the cause and the effect, but our, certainly our society is structured a lot around that. But there are many instances where you think, you know, it may be good if you read something, if you, that's not the only thing, the first thing you know about some, someone. If I read something and I don't know that this is a woman writing this, or it's a black person or a white person, or someone who wears their hair or a headdress in a particular way, maybe I will be able to see their words in a different light. And so that was one of the ideals of the online world, is it's not necessarily based on face. And there's been, through photography, not through these data issues, a whole history through the 20th century of thinking about portraits as not necessarily traditional representations. The early 20th century, painters like Picasso were experimenting with how do you break apart the notion of portraiture? This was his, a picture of his art dealer, whose mustache you can see, and his nose, but it was already starting to break apart the idea of what's important in the representation. This is um, Gertrude Stein, the poet, who, had, who was a poet, who was part, one of, part of um, Picasso's circle, and this is her portrait of Picasso, which um, it's a completed poem, it's the, if I told him, it's a completed portrait of Picasso, um, which I'm not going to read here, probably because we're running late already, but, and it's long and it's kind of very hard to get exactly where the portrait is in it, but what's important here is the notion that she, she's most famous for a book called The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, which is an autobiography in words of somebody else. But the notion that words are a big part of what can depict a person, that you can portray a person in words, perhaps in a more meaningful way. This is a response to Picasso's portraits, and part of it is her response to say, if it's not the face that we want to get at, perhaps it's the words and the words we can use about a person that can paint an even more evocative portrait than um, painting. This is um, George O'Keefe's painting of another photographer. Um, the interesting piece here is that it was meant that it was someone that she was in love with but didn't want to admit that she was in love with them, but was trying to create a painting that would maintain the privacy of who she was speaking about, but still be a very sensual portrait of a person that would evoke this notion of, something, of someone that was attractive and that she was in love with. Um, and here, finally, this is a much more recent one, it gets into the question of what makes data evocative. This is a painting by Steve Miller called The Genetic Portrait of Isabel Goldsmith. And here, we've moved into the realm of data, but completely outside of the realm of what is evocative. So what he did is he got genetic data about his subject, and then went and painted the data as it was on the sort of printout from the test um, strips. And what's interesting here is it really gets at that question of truth and accuracy because in many ways this is the most fundamental portrait you could make of a person. This is their genetic material, this is, you know, or pieces of it. And inherently it's sort of the instructions for making that person. What you get of that person, your sense of what they're like, who they are, what they might be like, compared to anyone else's genetic portrait is, is pretty much zero. So here you have data, where the data is very meaningful, um, but as a portrait, it gives you completely nothing. So what we're going to look at next are some, they're somewhat earlier works, because they're from when I was at, teaching at MIT, when I was teaching DMAR, um, and they're data portraits, but they're fairly simple. What I want to do in the next section is look at the notion of ranges of ways of 
representing data. What we, we were especially interested in was looking at depictions, ways of understanding how could we depict people in conversation spaces. If you've ever been involved in an online conversation, you know how often there's a lot of people that you're talking to, but you can't really keep track of who's who, what their role is in a particular conversation. And so what we were interested in was how can we make simple depictions with different statistics about them that would help us understand that space. So um, this is a piece by Fernanda Villegas, who's been a student of mine, and Mark Smith, who was at Microsoft, called Author Lines. And here, this is a way of showing how often they started a new conversation versus responding to another person. So here, this is someone who talks quite a lot, each one of those dots is a circle. The larger circles are when they um, were having longer, um, longer discussions are all sorted by that. These are their responses. And if you look at numerous ones of them, you can get some sense of how participatory they are. You get more, this is, so this is an interesting version. Um, so here, this, each of these are, um, what well, each line is one person. And so you get the sense of how a particular um, thread is going. What's interesting here is, one, it's, it's a pretty piece. Alone, you can't really make sense of it because you have nothing to compare it to. Someone else took the same concept and redid it. So you notice two things here. One is we can start getting much more meaning when we can compare things. But on the other hand, that you can take the same idea and make it fairly ugly very easily. Um, so this is a less attractive version of it, but what's interesting here is that um, they show the same patterns, but here this is someone who replies a lot. So their role is always to answer other people's questions. And so you see this like huge number of replies, very few initial statements. You see that, okay, in this conversation, this is that person who always answers questions, responds to others, doesn't have a whole lot of things they're asking from others, but is always um, participating this thing. This was this flame warrior. Here's someone who's just intensely argumentative. They write huge long screeds, they start their own screeds, they answer other people's screeds, but you can, you can get the sense they're loud, they're bellicose, they're aggressive. And you know, this is someone who's much more like the one we saw on the other slide of somebody who is sort of part of the conversation. They take part, they take turns, they're you know, a good participant in it. So, Part of it here, you start to see one, is it's fairly simple data, um, but that a lot of what's interesting is once you do a simple visualization like this, is that everything needs to be in the context of what's a norm. How do you compare things to other, to other people? Um, Could I just other, ask you why, why is this unattractive? Compared to this one, I think? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's much, to me, it's much busier looking. I think the added shading doesn't help. It makes it very bulbous. That may be an aesthetic piece, so, I mean, clearly whoever made it, I, I, to me, it <laughs> just felt that it was, um, it had too many, it has these extra lines that looks even more graph-like. But, I mean, again, part of it is that these are, as we'll get more into the discussion when we talk about the artist's role versus the subject, it's, yeah. A lot of it does come down to judgment, but um, so but the the other piece, whether whether you like this look or that look more, the other thing about it though is that given these circles, I'm telling you this is a representation of people, but it could be the stock market, it could be the size of crops. There's very there's nothing in it that tells you this is a person other than the labels. And so one of the other questions is, as we deal with data, are there ways in which the form can do something more meaningful? This one is an interesting one. This was done around the same time by another student, and it's very similar data, only she made it in the form of a flower garden, where for each user, replies were blue, initial statements were pink, but it was this flower garden. So the nice thing about this one was it was very intuitive. You have lots and lots of petals. It was a very active group. Each flower is a different person. If, um, if it was very sparse and weedy looking, it was a conversation that wasn't thriving. The problem here, though, is that it's a meta where is that while the metaphor is pleasant, this is one of the most reprinted pictures of any of the work we've done. It's been reprinted like 60 times 
it's in all these books, people love it. But the problem is while it's pretty, it also doesn't get at the meaning of the conversation because it imposes its own aesthetic onto the conversation. So it's nice if it's a support group and then it's flowery and it's very appropriate. But if it's very active because it's a whole bunch of you know Holocaust deniers or a racist forum, it will still be a very pretty garden. You know, it's a forum. So one part, the lesson here, I think, for future work is that it's a that there's a way, hopefully, of taking something like this and abstracting it, so that when you do visualizations, and I think this is true, especially in people, but certainly, is that if you go too far in the realm of being figurative without that figure having meaning, it's detracting. So making this very literally like a flower um, is probably going too far. On the other hand, working with the metaphor of the garden, saying, okay, we have to understand that growth that up is probably good for a long time, you know, because that, that's intuitive, things grow over time. The idea of the things being dense, oh, meaning more information, that a certain level of denseness means health is good, but if you can do that in a way without so literally evoking the garden, but using the meaning behind it to help people intuitively understand it is probably a better course of action. Um, Again, a lot of these were sort of experiments as we were thinking about them. This was um, an experiment called Anthropomorphs, where the idea was, okay, we don't want it to be flowers, why not people? Um, and here, it, it's also a little bit appealing. Each person was represented. So here the idea was to take a, a form represent how someone acted within form through a form. So here, all the times they participated are these squares. Um, there was different meanings to how they held their arms, whether they were central to the discussion and how they interacted with other people. Did they stay on topic was another form of balance. Um, there was some work looking at the affect of their conversation for the faces. Um, and you got something that, on the one hand, was very appealing, you have lots of little guys marching around a screen, it's certainly, if you look at it and you, you said, so, what does this information represent? You think people? You think, okay, that's, that makes sense, the horticulture. But again, it's, it has the problem, a couple of problems. One, um, the key one is that it resembles a person, but it doesn't resemble that person. It, the resemblance, the data is about them. But you, by doing this, have created a form that resembles a actual being, but it's not what that being that you're presenting looks like. And so there's things when you use a humanoid form, you have to be very careful. For instance, here, if someone is a prolific participant, they get rounder and rounder and bigger. So the bigness has a certain side. It does. It's very hard for something like this to get away from gender. They're very. So it's so specific and that the looks of this being are that person, it's also very problematic for representing a person. So here's a, another one that uses a much more human-like representation. So again, we would say this represents people, but I think in a less problematic way. So here, this is a representation of um, people on Twitter. And the way this works is we were interested in saying, okay, we can look at all the words that someone has used over time. Um, what are the words that they've used with uncharacteristic frequency? And on one side, it shows the words that they have used. I think this side is all the words they use over time. What are the words they tend to use lots and lots and lots that characterize the things that they speak about? And then on this side would be the things that they were speaking about most recently. So, you know, in the last day or so. So you have a sense both um, when this was live, the ripple and on and off, you would be able to see how active they are, what are they talking about now, and have a sense over time of what they're looking at. And so the idea here was like you would have you could have your know, whole wall, you know, you come home and it would show you like all your connections, what's going on, who's talking, you know, what are people talking about? And here the form um, doesn't add any meaning, but when we try different, you could do, you could put that same data in circles, you could put it in squares, but there was something very appealing about putting it in the silhouette that reminds you that it is information about a person.
so that you, you get that sense that it's not, you know, meteorological data or any other sort of raw data, but that it's, it's about a particular individual, but the information is encoded in the words without the individuality, the shape of it, imposing any meaning on the person. So the next se um, session, uh, section I want to talk about is the concept of data as mirrors and self-portraits. And one piece of that, there's a couple of pieces here. One is we're living in an era in which more and more of our information is online. How other people see us is increasingly online. So one of the issues is how do we appear to other people? How can we keep track of who we are? And then also just the sense of people are very interested in seeing what they have done. Uh, and what are some of the ways of representing that? And then what are just some of the styles that people come up with? This is um, Stephen Wolfram did Mathematica. He's a mathematician. So he has um, recently been releasing a lot of software to let people do personal analytics. And this is one personal analytics called the latest modification times of all the files of my of, of all my current files, basically. When were all the files on his computer last modified? And so one of the issues here that this brings up is what what is the data about you that is meaningful? You know, we can t we can look at someone's face and get a sense of whether a portrait of their face tells you something about the person. I think Having seen this as one of his feature self-representations, I think the fact that he chose this as a self-representation is in itself an evocative piece of data. I am not sure that if we all went around the room and created data portraits of ourselves showing the modification times of our files, that would necessarily be meaningful, but it does show a certain age and the complete use, the use of lots and lots of files. But so part of the issue is, what is the data that you would choose to represent yourself that is meaningful? So one of the most interesting um, people working this area is someone named Nicholas Feltron, who has come out every year since, I think, 2005 with what he calls the Feltron Annual Report. And they are basically reports about how his year went. And in 2007, he came out with this one and it says it's an exhaustive compendium of travel and activities in 2008. It lists, you know, all these things, you know, 366 days of walking, 455 subway trips, blah, 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 64 visits to the gym, three pools and ocean, one hay ramp ride, and 62 hours of grand theft auto. Um, and the thing that was so appealing about this was the, the funny choices of what he chose to show. I mean, if you start thinking about it, you start trying to collect statistics about yourself, there's an infinite set of things you can do. But what was beautiful about this was the, the set of things he did was very, it was just very nice. He, 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 um, here's the subway mishaps, three. Misstops, two. Wrong direction, one. You know, in all the you know, here's like all the miles that he took on the subway, but you know that he you know, puts, hangs, pulls out the little mishaps that he had meant that it was the self-portrait in data, but there's very much the hand of the artist as self-representation, as someone who is choosing particular things that you really start to feel some sense of who he is. So this is from the same year. Um, you know, least kosher meal, you know, at Momofugo. Um, you know, this is social meals, you know, the least expected menu item was flying fish, most ambitious cooking experiment, sous vide salmon. So here again, you get this uh, strangest cocktail. Um, the drink that he drank the most, you know, was Stella Artois beer. So it's a choice of things that by picking and choosing from the statistics, he's able to create what turns out to be a vivid self-portrait. So he does this year after year after year after year, and then he goes to work at Google, and he keeps doing this. What's kind of interesting is what's happened to these self-portraits over the years. This is the most recent one, is 2013, and the hand of the artist has kind of disappeared somehow. It's, it's, just, it's just really boring. Um, Here's SMS, the number of participants, the most SMS, the days without, average number, senders and recipients, email, exact same thing, Facebook messages, how many senders, how many recipients, 
all the stuff that you could just pull out as like the obvious data that you would pull out if you said, okay, what's the statistics about my email? You know, um, even when he did, does it looking at words, you know, most frequently used interrogative, how, okay? You know, longest word, uncharacteristically. It's somehow, I don't know if he lost interest, if he got more interested in the statistics, maybe he was able to actually do the big statistical analysis that he had, had the means to do before, but there's much more data in the more recent ones and much less portrait to them, which I think is a very interesting <coughs> phenomenon about this notion of what is it that sort of is the difference between the data visualization, which is later ones were, and the earlier one, which was much more of a portrait through data. Um, this is another piece that was done at the, um, at the Media Lab by a student, Yannick Asokova, and it was done right around the time that Feltron was coming out, and with his first report. There's a piece called Microcosm. And what, was my, what he did here was he made a website, and you could sign up, and you could make charts. The idea was just make statistical charts about your life. And again, what was interesting is the way people use this that was, it's, a lot of it is that so much of this is not so much the actual data, but the choice of which data to show. So here's one person who, okay, here's like the different places he's lived, you know, Portland, Redmond, Amsterdam, um, actual jobs held versus the fantasy career, and how many, like, so this is in years of employment, you know, lots, like four years as a receptionist, three years of the career in terms of wish, wishing, you know, three years of wishing to be a professor, and you say, oh, you know, six years of wishing to be a ballerina, you know. You get, it's here, it says, there's nothing particularly artistic about the visualization of the data. There's tons of them. Um, you know, here's a, another one from this one. This is um, someone who said, who I spend my day with? My boyfriend versus my cats. <laughs> yeah. So one more time, your cats. You have types of coffee, you have pieces, happiness. So it's just that this setting the time of like the time of day when you're with your cats and with your boyfriend was just very it gives you this little picture of the person. So a lot of what you're seeing in these it's not the the representation of the data is nothing. But it's the choice of data in that particular context that makes it into a portrait. And I'll just show you one more. It was um, the, um, the integrity of Agus's microcosm data portraits. Slightly untrue, fudge, not fudge, debatable. You know, the lunch sort, like lunch, lunch. Noodles, wraps, bagel, pizza, salad, leftovers. But the most, you know, this is my favorite one, I think, everyone, is how people found out about my birthday. <laughs> Actually remember the calendar, another friend, and Facebook. <laughs> yeah. So, Again, it's, it's the, but you get a sense of a person through this, of a type of humor that certainly isn't shown through what you're looking at, but it's shown through this way of speaking. And so here is something that, on the dry side, again, it looks back at those, um, somewhat like the game portraits. This is Stack Overflow, which is a very serious conversation site where they're trying to get people to provide data, to build up a knowledge database, and you have to have certain levels of reputation to be able to answer questions, and it's, it's very, very serious. Um, but this is how people are known on the site, is through all these statistics about how they have participated, what questions they've answered, how they've gotten different points for them, what badges they've gotten, where they have gotten them, and what, you know, it's a whole series of things that's very relevant to that space. And what's interesting about that here, from this point of view of, Self-portraits is two things. One is that it's starting to be that self-portrait not just as something that they show to other people, but that because they're showing it to other people and it grows through their participation in the site, it's about shaping your participation to create that portrait. Um, and so unlike the um, microcosm portraits, these cannot be fudged. You know, like she said, like, you know, most of hers were fudge. These are unfudgeable. It's, we'll be talking about the notion of the machine as artist. The only way you can shape your portrait on the site is by how you actually act. Do you actually ask, answer a question that people think was a brilliant answer? Then it will show up here. 
do, did you have questions removed because they were irrelevant? That will also show up here. So here is also this notion of this, the data portrait <coughs> is something that both shows who you are in a space, how you act, but that is designed in order to get people to shape it through their way of behaving on the site. So um, I'll go through this fairly quickly because I know we're running late. The other, another piece I want to talk about here, are we here? I think we're okay? Yeah, okay. Right. So um, is the idea of, of people being depicted through relationships, which is, you know, part of it, a lot of portraits are this sort of singular being, but a lot of portraits are about how people interact with each other. This is a great, I love this painting just in terms of every single person in the painting has some different relationship that you are seeing with the others, whether it's friendly or looking suspiciously at them. And that the way, a lot of what's interesting online is not just how you act on your own or what you're doing, but how you relate to other people. Um, in terms of relationship portrait, this is a, a fascinating one. The British artist Tracy Eman did an installation it's called Everyone I Have Ever Slept With. And all the names are embroidered in the wall. And it starts with her, you know, her mother from when she was little, but all her boyfriends and girlfriends. And, but it's a self-portrait in data through relationships on a fairly edgy scale. Um, this is another piece that we did at the Media Lab. It's called Female. And um, it doesn't, the actual colors were not quite so garish, but the only prints we have left from it were the versions that were meant to be printed, not projected. So the idea here is that these would be, this is um, a program that went through your email and let you look at um, your relationship with another person through the mail you had sent to them over time. And so each one of these columns, you know, is like a couple of months. And then the height of the column has to do, it's a histogram showing how much email was sent to them. And unfortunately, it's a little hard to read, but each of these are the words that you used with uncharacteristic frequency with that person during that time. So the background are words that you used over longer periods of time with uncharacteristic frequency, meaning more than you would expect those words to show up in the given language, and here the characteristic was even, was not just how, that it was words that you used unusually frequently, not compared just only to language as a whole, but to your correspondence as a whole. So it was really, what were the topics that stood out at that time? The thing that was interesting to us, uh, particularly interesting when we did this, was that, um, and I can show you close up so you can see the words a little better, um, was that we did it, Fernanda was her thesis, and then she did it, um, a test on users, and, you know, this work you could go through with any emails, where right? you could just be able to pick any person and see it, go through it all, and we just thought it was a way for people to really get a sense of who their own relationships were and understand that, and people really liked it for that. But what was particularly interesting was that a lot of people were printing them out. She tested it, I think, at IBM, and people were like living in cubicles, and they had all these photographs of you know, themselves here. Here I am on a hike. Here I am at my daughter's birthday party. And they'd print these out and put them on the cubicles. And what we, we thought, you know, that this was your email. You wouldn't print out your email and display it. But because it was just individual words, it was meaningful enough that you got a sense of the relationship, but it didn't feel private. It was just words. It didn't necessarily give you any information that you wouldn't share with others. And she said, and when um, she talked to people about why they did that, they said, you know, we don't have any pictures of our relationships online. You start to realize you can have so you can correspond with someone an awful lot, but and you can have a very intense relationship with them. But you can't depict that in any way. And so the way that you know you like to have pictures with your friends, this was a way of being able to depict a friendship that existed in the form of an exchange of information. Um, this. It's very, very hard to see. Um, okay, so I will explain this to you because it's quite hard. To, it's not showing up in white at all um, because there's two of them. So these are two pieces that were exhibited at um, the ICA. And what they are, you'll get actually once I explain it, you'll be able to understand it. What they are are, um, brought, are the um, layout for wedding, for seating at weddings. 
And what is depicted here is the groom and the bride, and the groom's mother and father, and the bride's mother and father. So the bride and the groom are the two circles in the middle, and the groom's mother and father are the, I think the groom is, is the yellow one in the middle, and the yellow, two yellow ones on that side are his mother and father, and the mother and father of the bride are there. What you're missing is the sort of pale gray that shows where all the other tables are. But here's another family. She had maybe eight of these. Um, here's another family where here's the, the bride and the groom at their table. And then there's the bride's mother and father up there. And there's the groom's mother. And there's the groom's father. So, and here she had like eight of them. And they were, they're really, I mean, some of them seem sort of hard for you. Look at this, and it's very simple. All you're seeing here, now that you know what this is, you're seeing eight little, you know, six little loops. But there's a huge story in those six little loops. Like, you, you know the story of, like, this estranged family, this, like, you know, the angry, you know, the angry parents. You can feel the whole thing. And so as you look through these different seating plans, um, it would tell these complicated family stories essentially through six little loops. So part of it is you bring in, a lot of it has to be the information that you bring in to your understanding. This is true of any kind of portrait, certainly the relationships of what is the norm that you're looking for and what happens when things deviate from the norm. Once you understand what your audience knows, there's a huge amount that can be done with this. This is Dietmar's work. Um, it looks familiar, right? Everyone's laughing here. It looks familiar to a lot of people. But, um, so, what this was was about taking the typical um, network map, where it shows here you are, and here's the network of the people who connect you. And the question that we were really interested in here was, what are the what's going on in these connections? How like what is the information that's going through them? Because it's not so much that you want to look at a network of people, but the way in that first painting we you know we said I said it was interested as a family, see how people are looking at each other. It's like get, how can you start getting a better sense? of those connections. Um, so here's another one. Um, this is another wedding one, but a somewhat happier wedding one. This is from a wedding invitation. Um, and here is the bride and the groom. And what they did was, it's, it's a very similar concept. They hand drew a social network map, but they had a line about each person. I'm going to have to read it off my computer so I can read it there. But um, so, uh, for instance, this is this one up here talks about Tom and Kay, and talks about how um, while the game was playing at Three Rivers Stadium, made a jumbo tram wedding um, proposal, which she did not notice. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and so it's like a witty, it's like little witty stories that connect each of the people in that space, and so. Part of it is that it was, it's, a, it's a lovely idea for a wedding invitation. I think, I think everyone should do this. Um, but the idea of probably you have all these people coming in who don't know who anyone is, how can you start giving people a sense of who are the players in this wedding that they're going to? You know, you know guests who don't know very many people. So it, would, it was the idea of being able to do the, enough of a group portrait through the relationships and through that one line so that you would start being able to make sense of people. It doesn't show all the interconnections between everyone, but it's enough to show by making a connection to have that person highlight as an individual within that particular social structure. Um, and then here what I want to talk about is the piece that you know, I alluded to in the beginning of what's the relationship between subject, audit, artist, and audience, and how they each play off their different desires to to have a representation be what they want to say. Um, and what we'll start here, we don't have to read, don't have to read all this either, is but what it is, is it's the new, the text of the new European law that says um, if somebody, with a number of caveats, but that basically if you feel that some information shouldn't be about you when it comes up on the Google search, Google needs to remove it. That you could start playing around. You could start thinking about a Google search on your name is perhaps one of the most vivid and used forms of literature of you that exists today. 
And this law said, we recognize this. And we are going to give you some ability to start taking things out of it, to start to shape that portrait, if you can give us an argument why that's a legitimate shaping. So even in the dry world of data and the seemingly factual basis of Google, this is a real ongoing struggle, is who, who has control over how you are portrayed. This will go back to Elizabeth. This is the darn new portrait of Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I, Queen of England, was very adamant about how she was portrayed. And what this portrait was pa painted in 1575. She was, I think, in her very late 20s or early 30s. She really liked this painting and, in fact, decreed that after that point, no other portraits were going to be made but, um, from life of her, that they would all have to be based on this portrait. So while she aged, her portraits do not age. And if you look at anything subsequent, they all look like this, and they're very, very youthful. So this one is a portrait from about 40 years later. And if you look at the face, it's very, very much the same face. It's just turned the other way, and, and a new dress. Um, but what's interesting, the, the thing, the reason I'm showing you this one is that um, this is by Gerard C. Younger. Younger got cut off, but there was another portrait that got that was turned up not that long ago, somehow in like Roanoke, Virginia. Um, <laughs> it's the same portrait, but was done in her studio, in that studio that apparently was what she was actually looking like at that time. This is the version of the official face, though, and this is the one that got shipped off to America <laughs> and hidden and turned up in like a golf course, apparently, that had once been, um, I guess, that Sir Walter, in an area that Sir Walter Raleigh, who had been her consort and then sent to America, had been at. So, but she had incredible control over what was going to be portrayed of her. So this is what happens when the subject has all the control. If you go fast forward, you know, five centuries, um, 20, this is a 20th century painting, or even 21st century. So Lucian Freud, very famous British painter, said, I would like to paint you Queen Elizabeth II. And she acquiesced without, I'm not quite sure why, because he's known for not making the most flattering paintings of his subject. And he painted um, Queen Elizabeth. Had someone painted Queen Elizabeth I like that, they probably would, in fact, have had their head cut off. Um, it's not a flattering portrait. She looks tired. She doesn't look particularly royal. It looks a little odd that she has a crown on her head. I um, I wanted to talk about this portrait, and I do talk about I do talk about it, but I don't have it in my book because when I went to ask permission, I have the Queen Elizabeth portrait in the book, and I wrote to there's a whole royal like your royal highness blah 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 that you write to to ask permission that one, but. There's been a huge shift in the power of the artist in the intervening time, certainly in the space, and that a lot of artwork now is really about how the artist is interested in depicting a subject. Um, what does that mean? You know, how, do, how does the, in the world of data we have the opposite problem? Is because when you're dealing with painting, it's hard. The artist's hand is the easiest thing to do. In some ways, it's harder for them to fill something in and to give the um, subject a voice. It's easier for them to have their own voice. How do you give an artist, what does it mean to have the artist's hand when you're dealing with data? So I'll give you, this is one example. Um, this is a piece that I did. It was a commission from uh, a Minneapolis museum to, they were having a whole discussion about, it was a very meta thing, discussion about visualizing conversations. And they said, can I do a visualization of the conversation about visualizing conversations? Um, and I'm not using this as an example of you know, great artwork, but just as a notion of what it means to have the artist's hand in it. So what I did was I took the transcript of all of the, of what everybody said, and this is the full transcript of the conversation, each one's in a different color, but just, um, and the time is marked by, oh, if the chat is the, the squares, but did it as a portrait by just making certain words bigger. And so that for this, this person who can be a very, very theoretical writer, I had phrases Foucault, structuralist, theory, agonistic pluralism, interlocutor, linguistic specialty, um, 
hegemonic control, because that's the only person who was going to use those words. It really characterized them, whereas um, this is the person who was trying to moderate the conversation. And the words that I picked up for her were calm ground, driving forces, question, round table. Um, for um, the person, you know, here's someone else who's like, network mapping, ego network, public data, was very much like a data scientist um, while this prepped. And so the idea here is that the, the, those were words that weren't necessarily something that you could compute. They were sometimes more unusual words that that person used, but it wasn't just their unusualness, because the please respond, please is not an unusual word, but it was the, the thing that said, as the artist, it is my sense that these are the types of phrases that most characterize what I think of your voice and your being in this spot. And so it was simply the enlarging of it that's the artist's hand, but that's what changes it into, from being a visualization of it, into being, I think, much more of a portrait where it's a subjective viewpoint of who the people are. I think if you read, you know, if you just read the transcript, you would have less of that sense. If you just read those particular words, it's about getting those particular characteristics of those people to pop out. Um, the other piece is the question of when is when the artist has a great deal of control with data portraits, is what are, what about the permission of the subject whatsoever to be in the portrait at all? You know, and this is a question that comes up in street photography, it comes up in visualizations of people when you have public conversations. This is an interesting example. Um, it's a piece by the artist Sophie Colley called Take Care of Yourself. Um, Sophie Colley is an artist. She, she has another piece that's actually really interesting, it's just not very visual, called Address Book, where she did a portrait. It's a, it's a book you can buy now. It's a portrait of a man who certainly didn't ask to have it be done in practice. Court order has been that it's only now is published because he died. Um, he was some guy walking down the street. He dropped his address book, and Sophie Colley found the address book and proceeded to call everybody in it and ask about him and <laughs> write down their answers. And um, he took her to court. She couldn't publish it until he died. He died. It's now published. But um, so, given that you could expect that when her boy, long-time boyfriend broke up with her, um, something would happen. So what happened when her, he broke up with her is he wrote, he also broke up with her by email. And he wrote her this email, leaving her, and I guess the last line in it was, take care of yourself. And so she did this mesmerizing exhibition called Take Care of Yourself, where she gave that email to maybe, I think, like a hundred different I think it's almost all women, but it's only a hundred different people, and said, can you represent this letter in some way? And um, this is just one example. This was a proofreader. You have someone who's a professional proofreader. That was their representation of the letter. Um, but you know, there were dancers that interpreted it, all different kinds of dancers. There were court stenographers, psychologists, psychiatrists, judges. Everything, but what you end up with is this fascinating portrait through this one letter of a person you don't know. Because for one, every bit of psychology, affect, anything that you could possibly get out of that letter has been refracted in a hundred ways. So it's like a hundred different views on someone through this one piece of data. But because it's also a hundred different people looking at a single piece of data, you sort of get a hundred different perspectives on who those people are. But certainly wasn't with his permission. Um, this is a more traditional portrait. Um, it looks like it, it's a street photograph. It's by a series by Philip de, um, de, 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 de Corsia called Heads. But what's interesting from our perspective as data from this is two things. One is these are street photographs that were done. You know, so, okay, so the subjects did not give their permission to have these done but they were done completely mechanistically. He set up a strobe light in Times Square and a camera, and the strobe and the camera were tripped every time someone walked on a particular mark on the sidewalk. Um, 
people didn't know they were photographed because it was in daylight. So it's just such it's just a really bright strobe. So the way the camera set up, it looks like it's dark, but it's just because it's set up so that it's the right exposure for these. And there, so here, two pieces is, what is the artist's role here where it, there's such a machine taking it? So the artist's role was simply, was it setting up the situation and then in choosing which of the pictures to subsequently exhibit, which, you know, to say which are the interesting pieces. Um, this is all, this is, a, this is also the section called, All the Things That Will Get You Into Court. So this rabbi saw the exhibition, recognized himself. So this is also, I guess, currently in court, or it was just recently settled. But he, he took um, the artist to court saying, you can't just steal my image and profit from it this way. So there's the tension between the artist and the unknowing recipient of their artistic eye. Um, and finally, here um, is this is something called Collision from Mozilla. This is a portrait that you can have taken of yourself. This is a portrait um, of someone, but you can do one, you look the same. It's your browsing history through all the things that follow you. So if you use the Firefox browser, you can download Collusion, and it will give you a portrait like this of who is watching you as you browse through the web. So it's it's a sort of an ability to get a sense of what who you are being watched by. And that's you know a big piece with these with other <coughs> questions that come up around data portraiture because there's a vast difference between the data portrait that I make to show you something interesting about your, myself that I, that I make through my actions in a website I have chosen to participate in because I want the type of interaction that that type of thing gives me versus a portrait that I inadvertently make and that is made by digesting data about me by a huge number of outside watchers. I mean, this itself isn't so much the portrait as it's a indication to you of the type of data or at least some of the information about who are some of the eyes that are looking at you and taking much more detailed images and representations of where you go, what you read, what you look at, and creating a portrait of you. Um, that's Amber Fleet Jimenez. Excuse me? Uh, Amber Fleet Jimenez yeah. from, mm -hmm. yeah. from MIT, I think so. Um, and then finally, I'm skip through that. Um, so the, back. the last one I'll just talk about here is um, a final piece. Of How did I get that? There should be Zen and Mike. I, I also spent some time, probably the same uh, amount between my cat and my boyfriend who works during the day. My cats don't really walk on my keyboard. That should be Aaron and Zen but I have a cat who edits things for me. Um, <laughs> but this is a piece called Personas, and if you the picture that was at the beginning of the slides and that's on the cover of my book. It's from a very big exhibition that we did my last year at MIT that was about surveillance and eyes looking at you. And there were several pieces within it. Um, the ghost at the beginning of at the first slide in, in the posters for this is what's called a data ghost. It was all the words around a person that would be collected in this exhibit and it would run around on screens that were looking at it. But this was another piece that was in the exhibit called Personas and what it did was it looked at, you would um, go and you'd say, oh, type in, we'll tell you something about yourself. And people type their name in. And it went and it grabbed all the information it could find about you from a big search engine. And then it attempted to characterize you according to different machine, according to machine learning algorithms about whether you, know, you were more domestic or legally oriented or socially or oriented sort of watching and sort of thinking, going through these different characteristics, and it would come up with what was often a fairly plausible portrait. Now, but it was, people loved it, they loved putting the names in it, um, it's online still, people still use it, but I've seen a lot, I've seen lots of portraits that people made of this, and they put on, you know, they put up on Flickr or something, but it was really meant as a critique of the machine as artists, because it doesn't, it's not a very smart artist. It does not know. It's very good if you have an unusual name. It's not so good if your name is John Smith, because it's a group portrait of you and all the other John Smiths who have ever done anything online. 
it's not very good at words that are ambiguous, but it's good at giving you something that seems right. People feel like, oh yes, this really tells me something about myself. But it was often really fairly wrong, but there's something very enticing and tempting about the sense that something is telling you information about you and that the machine is telling you interesting things about yourself. So it was really designed to be a very enticing warning about the machine as artist. Um, in this particular case, there was also the fact that it was itself a stealth data collector because in the exhibition as a whole, once you typed your name in, then we had the names of the people who went to the exhibit. And there was a soundtrack that, you know, at first was nature sounds, then city sounds. And then you start to realize you're hearing something familiar. And it was your phone number or your home address. Because once we knew your name, then we would look for any personal data we, would, we could find like that and put it in the soundtrack of the space. So it was also this question of once the machine is looking at you, what does the machine tell to the rest of the machines? Thank you.